Okay. All right. So as it has been a tradition for the past uh, 3,000 years at this meetup, um, uh, the language that we speak is English, because we always have a couple of people that are not fluent in Zurich Deutsch. So um, also this time it will be in English. Um, we just checked on the, on the meetup.com website when we had the last in-person meetup. And the last one was actually at SME in March 2020. Um, that's you know it's about 100 years ago, and then the last one we had here was on the 12th of uh, November 2019. So that's about 3,000 years ago, and uh, so it's it's great that we have a, a group here listening to the next talk, which is super interesting. So <clears throat> Sandro asked me on uh, Skype if he wants to do a meetup, and I said yeah, sure, let's do that. And um, so and he offered himself to talk about language attrition which made me fire off um, Wikipedia immediately because I had no clue what language attrition was. Um, but since I, um, my background is in linguistics, of course that was super interesting to hear. And he makes a link to the COVID uh, seclusion that we all went through, but which makes it especially interesting to listen to that. Um, in general, I think language attrition is the effect that happens when someone um, migrates to a different country and is immersed in that um, country's language and then starts to lose his mother tongue or starts to lose the exact accent of his mother tongue and well, just develops an accent in his own um, uh, language that he or she spoke best before. And uh, so I'm, I'm super interested in listening to what uh, Sandra has to say about that in the combination of COVID. Um, usually I have this slide set on, you know, meetup of tests and making a couple of uh, <laughs> advertising words for my own company. I'm not going to bore you with that and I think I'll just pass on the word to Sandro and uh, I'm super curious. All right, Sandro? Thank you. Stage yours. Yeah. I'm sure you're hiring again, aren't you? I, oh, yes, 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 absolutely. So it's going to be a hiring. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so is Sandro, so it's kind of uh, whoever you think is more uh, suitable for your needs, so it's got to be more stationary uh, than there. If you were this cool kid who really wants to go to different companies, and kind of, you know, rock star and travel around, <laughs> then uh, that has the best place. All right, Sandro. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, children. Let's start with the joke. The two fish swimming upstream, not downstream, they are swimming downstream, and the salmon is swimming upstream, and the salmon asks the two fish, Hey guys, how's, how's the water up there? The fish aren't saying anything. The salmon thinks, oh, how rude. And after a while, one fish says to, the, says to the other fish, what the fuck is water? Like, begin with that joke. Then, as it result, a little talks about language attrition in times of COVID, and this is a definition that I found uh, in the internet refers to gradual reduction or loss of linguistic knowledge and skills in an individual. Um, I'm not doing this mother tongue thing, but still speaking about what I think would be language attrition in, in, in our case. Questions. Who of you doesn't remember a time, or remembers a time where he didn't speak a language? You remember not speaking a language? I remember your own language. language? I remember it to try, trying to understand the language that was and your own language or mother language, whatever it is. Ah, I, know. Uh, I feel like we understand. Yeah. And then we have another language. What well, do they speak now that don't speak? That seems to speak. <laughs> your own language is a language, yes. Excuse me. That's, that's a funny thing because nobody, that's plain nobody of us remembers a time where we weren't able to speak. Mm -hmm. So language is like water. Like the two fish said, what the fuck is water? This uh, language is everywhere. It's behind us, but it's, it's, a it's uh, in the future. And because of that, we often don't think as a language as a tool. Because language is here. Everybody knows how to communicate. It's easy as pie. But that's sarcasm, by the way. And my claim is language is one of the most important tools of a context driven test. It's a claim. Let's see. I'd like to take you on a journey to explore what I said and what I mean. The 
without that, we need an agreement and a few things. I have two sentences, and the first is use it or lose it. Can we agree that on a general term, this has some truth? It's like when I learned to juggle in, in, when I was a child, and nowadays I'm not as good as I was before. Is it okay for, for you? Is it? The second th thing is you are always training something. It's like I'm telling my kid, if you are, have a sloppy handwriting and doing, doing that all, all day, you're training like sloppy handwriting. It's not getting better. And But that, if I have to use it, I can be good. No, you can't because you train sloppy handwriting. Good. So now we remember the I claimed that uh, that where are you? Language is one of the most important tools for complex tests. And then, like, let's take a look. Some benefits of language knowledge. I think it helps us to think differently if you use it as a tool. And there are many, many ways. And by all means, I'm not a linguistic guy, nothing thing, but still I try to use the tools. Let's look through some examples. Semantics, one of uh, Hillary's favorites. It's a bit, you have this sentence. If the amount is high 150 Swiss francs, whatever, <coughs> a warning should be issued before sending it to the server. So it's like every tester here in the room should be afraid if he sees a thing like that. What you can do now is take and take and analyzing it word by word. Well, what do you mean by if? If, what do you mean by the amount? Is the amount? Is it the amount? What do you mean by amount? Is is what? Is higher? It is not? Is maybe higher than what? 150, 150 what? A warning? What do you mean by warning? Should, what do you mean by should be? Why not is? What do you mean by issued? Who is issuing anything? Before, before what? Sending? Sending how? It? What? What is it? Is it the amount? Is it 150? Did we make this comparison because there is like a Swiss thing uh, to the server to what? There's, this is the power of semantics. If you, like, yeah, you can take it at absurdum uh, and, and be really, really evil. But I like this. I like this tool. I like this idea of do you or do I really know what I see? Let me make a comparison to logic where we still use language. We have the same sentence. If the amount is higher, da da da, should be da da da. But what we can do now is take the few sent the two sentences and say, okay, we have if the amount is higher than 150, this this is P, then therefore a warning should be issued before sending it to the server. This is Q, and this little sign means implies, so P implies Q, and make okay. We make a nice truth table out of it, and we say we have true, 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 false, and now it's getting interesting. We have false, true. And now we can start to think and, and 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 think about how could P be false, and then realizing we never kind of, we maybe never um, threatened the. Uh, uh, took the assumption and said, is it really 150? Like, it could be 1.50, 1, 1. it could be 15. So maybe P is false. We didn't know that maybe because we didn't uh, take the truth table and did it really methodic, methodic, something like that. Did, this may be a good example to use that. So questions. What do you think? Did we lose these skills now during, during COVID? But I spoke about language attrition and knowledge skills and losing stuff. Did we use? Did we lose this kind of language thing? Yasmin is wobbling with the hand. Florian, what do you think? I don't think also, because th this is stuff that we can train on our own. We, we don't need anybody else to do this stuff. So it's not that stuff that I'm talking about. So what I'm talking about. So what do we lose? 
skills that we use in direct engagements, like communication. Why do we lose these skills? There's, I blame remote communication because that's the thing that we have. As, and I, I didn't see Yasmin in months. Uh, or Floria. The Mark is uh, working in the same building, so sometimes. Yeah. But any of you, I, Hillary, when we did, did we saw each, each other like, I don't know, two years ago? Something like that. And therefore, I claim the lack of training and therefore the experience that comes with certain situations. So what do I mean by that? Let's explore possible communication types. Communication sometimes is like this job. You have a lot of things in it, like, like a, fund, a fundament, some stuff for grows, stones, box, whatever they may there's like a concept like big talk. Like this is really big stuff. Did we lose anything in big talk? I don't think so because we scheduled this, that stuff before. So I, if I have to fire something, fire, fire somebody in an extreme case, we have this big talk and speak about it and maybe before a few times. Why do we have this situation? It's, it's not a random situ situation. It's not, oh wow, I want to fire Floyd. Go away. No, it's not. It doesn't work that way. Like, a bit like personal talk. Personal talk is like a little more personal than stuff that we do here. So it's like, how are you and what do you do? We, we can, still can do that in like one-to-ones, something like that, but it's not quite the same. Because as I said, we are remote, one is here, one is there, and but it's still manageable. We have like small talk. Small talk is the funny thing because it's like the, all the stones in, in this really big jar. Um, we don't do small talk or, um, over remote. It's kind of it's not it's not spontaneous. It, it's kind of, you have to schedule stuff, and if you have to schedule it, it's, it's not like small talk. It's, it's it's something else. So there are these little things. How are you? How was the weekend? And I told Yasmin, like a few years ago, I had somebody said, yeah, it's good, I did that with the kids, and that, and that, and over, over the, like, the two weeks, I realized he never said anything about his wife. He did all the things with the kids. So by asking, hey, is everything okay at home? He said, yeah, yeah, no, you know, we are still in divorce. And, and it, sometimes it's a little things that you don't hear. Oh, we don't do a lot of arguing. Not as much as we did before, because everyone was in the same building. Like there was really emotions and tensions to argue about something. Today it's really, really easy to hide. To oh, I don't want to do this talk. I maybe I don't have time because I'm remote. I'm home. I can say I have another meeting. Some stuff like that. It's not going to work if you're everybody. Everybody's in the building. And we need to argue. I like to argue. I like to dispute. We need to speak about things and not agreeing all the times. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's, it's good for the culture. It's my place. Spontaneity, well, you can read for yourself. Uh, there is no spontaneous thing if you work remote, if you are not. In times of COVID where everybody is at home, or where, where a friend of mine is working for a company, there is no office anymore. Everybody is working remote. So it's, you have to schedule everything. Not sure if there's fun and no, it's not fun. What is the true danger? What do you think from all these things that I, that I mentioned now? It's not to lose skills. Yeah, we lose skills, but in times these with communication, um, it's the thing you're always training something. And that's what scares me. Because what do we train? We train to speak less. We train not to argue as much as we could. Because there is, there is no, the situation is not there. We're not training it. We train to keep a job. <coughs> Am I allowed uh, 
to, uh, to bug somebody? Am I allowed to write? Am I allowed to interfere? It's, it was easier when everybody was in the same building because we were some, sometimes we were in the same office and maybe I hit, ah, today I'm not feeling well, or I'm not really proud of what I did today. I heard that a few times. So I can look back and say, okay, tell me, what is it that you want me to take a look? Because it, it's maybe not, yeah, you know, it's that and that, and then that was complicated. It's like we try to hide that. Okay, it's easy, remote, to be at home, to not write. It's not every, everyone is like so, so pushy as I am. And we train to narrow all our field of view. Of view. So I think it was, it was much easier when everybody was together to, to hear different opinions. Now I can like cancel this view that I would like it. And that's the thing we, we, that scares me the most. We train all these things. We don't have any awareness. So what does it mean for the future? To be honest, I don't know. And that's where I'd like to dis that's like I'd like to start the, the discussion now. What do you think? What that means? What that could mean? Last year, I brought two new colleagues. Mm -hmm. Exactly when Corona started, and both are gone now mm -hmm. because it was extremely hard to onboard them. They knew that they don't know much and that's why they try to hide themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, we, we had uh, additional meetings, we had uh, removed breaks and uh, online events and all that. Uh, but it was not allowed to, to meet in real time. And so nobody was able to see how they feel. And now when it is allowed again, we, we have new colleagues. We, we just meet in, in the office. We have our days, not every day a week, but one day a week when we meet in the office and we are able to onboard them better because we have our breaks, we are in the same room, we see each other, we see if somebody has a question, just a question mark in the eyes. Yeah. So I think in future it's necessary uh, to, to meet again. <coughs> same place but perhaps companies find out that it's uh, much cheaper to have people at home I don't know but our company I'm like well you don't have to pay rent so yeah maybe yeah but at the moment not I think it's, it's important to to work in the same place at least some days a week I think you made a really interesting point about um, uh, seeing the conf confusion in people's faces. Yeah. Um, I worked as a teacher for a short time for uh, like a secondary school and then it was really important to see the students because if you ask who doesn't get it, nobody will answer, but yeah. you see that they don't, they don't get it and it's much harder to see. Um, first of all, if you're remote, you may have a camera but even then, it's it's not the same. Yeah. And I think that's a, a really good point, um, especially when teaching somebody, because um, remote teaching requires uh, way more um, initiative of the uh, of the person learning. And if you're there, you you have an immediate reaction to your questions, even if if the reaction is nothing at all, yeah. because nothing is a, is an is a, re a reaction as well, but like if you if you're on Teams or whatever, and there's no reaction, it's just standard. There may, maybe there's no camera, there's a muted sound because it's easier to not have a confusion and uh, there's that distracting sounds. So it's normal to have no no sound as a reaction and just a little bit of a visual re reaction sometimes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a that's a really interesting point. You, you make a good point, Mark. One of our sales uh, told me a few weeks ago that like like the first steps in the software development pro process is the handshake. The handshake that we are missing now, that some sales at Airborne are really, really missing because they say, you know, that first handshake is so important like to establish like um, the relationship to see where is the, the, the counterpart, the other part, is he confident, is she not, who is it? And, and it starts with them. I, I put a bit up by thinking I wrote, what does that mean for the software uh, development process? I think the software development process, development process is a complex system with a lot of moving parts. And by isolating them and taking a few things away, I'm not sure how good we can help the customer with his desires, what he needs and what he, want, what he wants. There will be things that are going to be lost. And I also think, for example, here at Aragon, um, sometimes during lunch, I guess if you talk about stuff and you approach it with the problems, you can like draw synergies between the teams. And I was, for example, struggling with something, and then I learned, ah, oh, Florian is doing this like every day, and only by chance I then started to like contact him and ask him about how he's doing this in this in the business. But I would have guessed if, for example, if I would have met him or someone else earlier than this discussion that come later. Maybe if you knew him, the question is, would you ask him if you only know that he knows how to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the handshake, it's the first handshake. It's breaking the ice. Yeah. <laughs> There is also a very peculiar effect when <clears throat> your audience is not uh, physical people sitting in front of you, but uh, when you're speaking to a screen where everyone has just switched off their video camera and you have no idea who is behind there. Um, it's just the richness of language gets lost. There's some effect of uh, audience energy that is not present, and that's super weird. Um, one of the most exhausting experiences I've ever had was giving a full day workshop uh, on testing to my own screen. Um, at the end of the day, I was just completely exhausted. And that was very weird because it's just in general, it's kind of people exhaust me. It's kind of the, as a, I'm an introvert, but I'm a highly trained introvert, so I can just pretend to be someone who is uh, uh, <laughs> uh, connecting to people. But it's kind of, I like people in small doses in general. Um, so big crowds still exhaust me. But I've just found out during COVID that the complete absence of large crowds is even worse than having many people in front of you. Um, it also has this effect that it's just it, the, the, the range of vocabulary just shrinks to, to a basic set of, of words and it just feels very, very weird. And it's just, I, I think humans are not, I mean, we evolutionary probably did not develop into beings who speak to their own screens. <laughs> and I think that's, that's one of the insights that we have here. But I love it. I have, I have the same situation with the test academy that we had with Airborne. And I'm speaking to the screen and I hate it. I don't see the people, I don't see the joy, I don't see the confusion. It's kind of, I see my own PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. I feel you. Yeah, I think losing uh, vocabulary is really interesting because um, you learn to express yourself in a different way because you know that maybe the microphone um, doesn't pick up that uh, that much, or if you like, if you have pauses to think, it's um, way harder to have this um, uh, dynamic in a discussion when you're online. Because you know, if I wait um, two seconds, I say nothing, I make a pause, and then people don't know if they can talk, mm -hmm. and because you have to wait and you 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 have to get another rhythm. To, uh, especially in the discussion, because uh, mm -hmm. a lot of programs like Microsoft Teams, um, they just um, they just mute people if there are different voices uh, simultaneously, or if you talk, they mute the rest, like on your phone. And so it's it, it's really hard to interrupt somebody, and that's uh, sometimes that's uh, important as well to interrupt somebody. Uh, else you, you can't make your point in this moment, and five minutes later, it's. Uh, it doesn't make sense to uh, make your point then. Yeah.
So you have another uh, I mean, choice of word, words, yes. mostly. Interrupting is interesting. I'm used to interrupt in a group by taking my hand up, just waiting if somebody reacts, and it works every time. But if you are, for example, in a Microsoft Teams conference, there's also the feature, take your hand up. Mm -hmm. But if I am sharing my screen and presenting something, I don't see the hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to have a moderator for yeah. stuff like that, yeah. and a moderator is not needed if everybody sees everyone. Yeah. And I kind of really experience that I interrupt more often than I usually do, because usually you wait and see how the other people uh, react, and then you sometimes or most often give them like the first turn. And in teams you have just an idea, and then you start to speak, and then, uh, then all, are, all are kind of confused, and then so for me, it's kind of the opposite. <laughs> it's also weird. But <laughs> I had a funny situation today with another test talk. We were discussing something, and I was thinking, thinking, and thinking. And after a few sh sesh, uh, seconds, he said, "Hello, hello, are you there?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm still here. Ah, oh, yeah, but every this. call starts like that. Yes, I, I, know, <laughs> <every> <laughs> I thought I lost <laughs> you. The, the, the screen froze. No, I'm I'm thinking and not moving. That's it. <laughs> Are you sharing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's like a 19th century phone. Well, hello, hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello. No, you're mute, you mute. <laughs> but please mute yourself, mute yourself. We can't expect a constant flow of information, right? Yeah, what are you thinking about? Mm, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm not willing uh, to, to jump into the rant against uh, teams so I, because it is a, <laughs> a burden, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking what, what I'm taking with me uh, from this uh, evening and what's what the key takeaway. For me? For me. No, so you can't answer this. <laughs> I can't tell you about this. For me, we always train something. That's the thing, thing to, that. I'm delighted about, but what scares me the most in situations like this? So one theory would be because uh, on the communication platforms that we use, which are video-based, and which also remove a lot of the subtleties in non-verbal communication, that yeah. people need to train to become better in verbal communication and be more accurate in, in that sense. There are many of these non-verbal cues that just simply uh, simply disappear because of, first of all, the two-dimensionality of the video, there are the little noises that are not there, especially if there is programs that auto-mute people. Um, so so the, the little noises are not there. Also the whole uh, body language is, is only there to a limited sense. So maybe people then need to train themselves to become more literal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, Sandra said, it's it's not the big things, the big talks, the really important yeah. things that uh, get lost a bit. It's like the, the small things. Um, um, I have to change the way I talk sometimes because um, if I, I call my friends or I talk to them in person, I can call my friend an ass and it's okay, they know how, how it's meant. Yeah. But like in a group, it's, it, uh, in a group online, it, it's uh, way harder to, well, use a bit more uh, a risky language or like uh, more um, familiar, familiar language. Um, with people because it's it's way harder to to like um, um, get across how you mean that because there is um, way less chance for interpretation. It's like when you text somebody, you have to put all the emojis to to signal how you mean it, and so so it's uh, it's kind of like that. There's there's less um, less hints to yeah. interpret. Also, if you have a look, uh, when there's a camera crew on the street. Walking up to a couple and just kind of filming them, they become very stiff. And that's, that's us, everyone in the video conference, often that's oh shit, we're being filmed here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's kind of, it removes a little bit of the, the naturalness. Yeah, 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 even with the camera on, yeah. you're not yourself, yeah. or not fully. Yourself. And here, I mean, there's a camera on, but it's not on us, so it's just on Sandro. So it's a stiff one. My wife started that UBS two years ago. 
during COVID. And it was a really, really funny situation, but we didn't have Skype for business, they don't have any video conferences. So she only heard people who never saw them. So like one month ago, she saw for the first time part of the team. And it's really, really to work with people that you only hear, you have, don't have any faces. There is kind of a disconnection there, but she likes the people, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. So are we headed towards this kind of future? I wonder. Yeah, that's interesting because I am for um, all the ones who don't know me yet. I started here um, at Airborne this summer, so I'm quite new and I don't know um, everybody yet. And it's um, way easier to remember the faces that I saw uh, within the team event. We went go karting, and it's way easier to remember those people than all the other ones from my team. Um, we. Um, I, I did little I did some little exercises when I um, to learn stuff as part of my onboarding here, and one of the tasks was to interview like different people from the team to uh, get to know how how they use testing techniques, and it was really inter interesting because at the beginning or at the end I don't know but I took like ten minutes of the interview just um, to ask. Um, who are you? <laughs> How did you get here? What did you do before? What what are you doing now? And it's like to know, to get to know the people a little bit, but it's still not the same. Uh, I think it's easy for all of us to agree with that. So uh, I want now to bring a little bit of conflict. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes. And uh, my biggest question is why do we train to do those things? Because I do think there probably is an alternative. Okay, true, all of us were not used to this reality, or most of us outside of working mostly remotely with, uh, with uh, our teams. And we spent 20, 30 years training to interact with people in person. So yeah, we are good at that. Well, I'm not that good, I'm a bit introvert also, but yeah. But you get what, uh, what I mean. So, uh, and this came all of a sudden. It's not like something that we could prepare and say, okay, let's prepare these three months because then we are going to start working completely remotely and this is the way to do it. So, at least me, uh, we had to pick tools to start interacting because sometimes we didn't need all those tools and now we do. And we are not the best at using those tools, and we are not the best at communicating through those tools. So I'm not saying that it could be a complete replacement, but maybe we are training that which is on the screen because we don't know how to train alternatives that could work. I'm not saying that it would be a perfect replacement, but it could possibly work. Yeah, I like this thought. It's, it's a good one. It's one of the many reasons why I wanted this. Uh, I wanted this talk to do, like to give awareness that we are doing these things, but it do doesn't have to be this way. Yeah, that that's what you said at the beginning. Nobody of us remembers um, a time where we didn't understand some language, well, not one specific language, but any language, and this is because um, your proposal. This is extra effort. And we're not used to um, to um, take um, to put in this extra effort just to communicate. We're used to um, communicating like we always do, and, and that's why we train those easier routes. Yeah, and and yeah, to, to combat that a little, uh, we would have to well, put in a bit more like and. Just uh, like this talk, but uh, um, just to be aware maybe helps a lot already. Yes, sure. uh, yeah, I, I had to. I I did the team of developers. Uh, I did have to uh, try new ways of communicating to improve. But I, I to completely agree that is the default. Uh, and uh, and for me, all of those five points actually. Have the theme, which is being a lot more automatic, automated about the way we do things, and the price we pay. Well, we we personally all, all pay a price in terms of 
uh, social mobility, right? But the price we we pay also as a project is that there is not much conflict. So whatever is said first, that's what everyone is going to do, and no one is going to argue against it. Because uh, because it is a lot easier when we are in, in in person to contradict and say, look at these alternatives, than when you are uh, in a team setting, for example. Uh, or something like that. I'm not sure if I agree 100% with um, this because Good. I mean, because of the experience, um, I worked with like an offshore team in Cairo, mm -hmm. and um, the people were usually pretty shy in expressing their opinions. Mm -hmm. But the moment we started to get online, kind of, um, I don't know how you say this in English, but um, they started to be more. Um, started more to criticize and express their opinions. For them, it was actually even better that they had a distance of people because we had in Switzerland in our team a lot of people with like a very strong presence and they were quite dominating. And the, the online more kind of equal to the people out. So they were near uh, <laughs> in some point. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah, well, it's always more difficult um, to be confident in a foreign space like in a, in a space you're not used to. So. Yeah, there could, could also be the cultural reasons. Yeah, I mean, it's for the context. But, uh, but I, I do read that for some people it's easier mm -hmm. uh, when they are on their own space, yeah. which most of people are right now, right? They are at their home. So they feel safer. And for some, some people, that means that they are more open to conflict and for some people that means just relax. Mm -hmm. There are also people who just can interact with they are invisible because they don't feel the reaction. Mm -hmm. You hear something but you don't realize who said this. <laughs> it's like comment sections. Yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You said that you have to um, like adapt and implement a new uh, for new communication techniques. Do you have um, an exam? Well, I didn't have any option actually because I'm not working with a remote team just because of COVID. Uh, my team is off in Brazil and off in Portugal, so I could not <laughs> anyway, do it in person. Uh, but uh, when I, when I started, uh, we did tend to, to, do, to do it that way. And then um, some strategies that, we, that I used were uh, like brainstorming between the whole team, uh, what is working and what is not. And uh, one of the topics that most of you uh, talked about was showing up, because you know, being there connected is not the same thing as showing up. Everyone agreed that that is not cool. So uh, we started to always have our cameras on. That really improved communication. Mm -hmm. okay. um, in uh, asynchronous messaging, like when you send a message or email, something stupid like using smiles or, or memes or stuff like that really improved the communication because it kind of created that that fun part of it. And since you, we are missing the physical two cues, right? Uh, adding smiles that express the sentiment with which you are saying that also apparently helps a lot. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I really uh, like the option for, uh, option for a chat. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have a tool um, mm -hmm. to chat with people. Um, but uh, for example, my girlfriend hates texting, mm -hmm. and so f for her it's the same as for me. I, I really like that you you can write something and it's not as formal as an email, for example, and you don't have to dear blah blah blah. Then your text and uh, best regards. In a chat, you can just say hey, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. And that's it. And so you don't have to do that in text. 
But yeah, those, those were experiments that you tried um, that had positive results. Yeah. Uh, but it's never like if we were all in the same office. Mm -hmm. uh, I do agree with that. Because it's there to get on a whiteboard, challenge yeah. yes. ideas each other and push each other to another level. And so that's everything. That's what I miss the most, actually. Yeah, me too. You know? No so small problems, nobody talks about small problems or small ideas. So no. it's just if you have a really good idea or a big problem. Yeah. Work becomes a lot more individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have those, let's, let's uh, be for 15 minutes here on the whiteboard and uh, experiment with stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were promised the whole deck, so all graphic projections, everything, where, where is the panel? And there is a pandemic coming, and there is no whole deck. Come on. Fire, 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 pants on fire. <laughs> I, I, do th I do think that uh, many companies are already thinking about better ways of doing this. And we will have better ways of doing this. I think that uh, the personal touch will always be necessary. And it's just interesting because a lot of companies like structure it's their office to bring people together to actually support this kind of communication. But now you really need to think about okay, what do I do when everyone's like dispersed or the whole world? Right? Mm -hmm. yes. So it's total contrast. I mean, one of the disadvantages of the open plane offices was that. Uh, you could find this time where you have this high concentration work mm -hmm. in solving a problem without interruption. Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the, the better things that happen with these people, you know, people just being close in, in their own homes that you were less interrupted and there was probably more mm -hmm. concentrated work on, on, you know, very really immersed into a problem. Mm -hmm. And there was just no interruption if you knew how to kind of switch off every uh, notification signal that came from your, uh, from your computer. But there was just a, it just afforded the capability to have longer stretches of very focused work. Yeah. I think there's value in that as well. Mm -hmm. I did have uh, several conversations about that, that with different teams. One thing that I did realize is that this open space concept is a concept that is kind of, of uh, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, yeah, it's really good for managers because you can be aware of what uh, is happening. Aware in the sense that you can help people, not in the sense that you can control them. <laughs> um, and uh, it's really uh, nice also for people that are more in the social parts of the th uh, things. I hated open space when I was a developer. It was for me the worst thing ever. I was disturbing the whole time. I could not perform correctly. After I became a manager, it was okay. <laughs> but then I started to realize, okay, I would prefer it to be open space now, but I'm in uh, egocentric now, right? So you told your people, off your headphones, I want to inflict that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't create it. Nice no, I didn't create it to an open space, uh, but we also had places where people could go yeah. and, and just for situations like this, when I find something as a tester, and at the end I have two or three developers behind my back, everybody who watches my screen, and these are the situations I really miss, you know. I watch with one developer, one developer, you hear that? Okay, yeah. come to check, okay, at the end three, maybe not a manager walks by, but then at the end you find something that was just a little tiny. Which I had big problems at the end. So. Yeah. So, should we move over just to the social area and have stop the recording? So, it's going to now. Yeah, everyone has behaved very well, so now it's going to let's stop the video. <laughs>